Okay, now it says setting up your stream. Okay, you're live. Yay. Well, hi, everybody. Um, this is Amy Hahn, and I'm with, we're, have, we're doing gardening tips live. Uh, the Knoxville Area Gardening Tips Group. It's good to see you all, and I'd like to introduce my co-host, Toby Johnson. Hey guys, nice to see you today. And Roseanne Smith. Hello. And we are all Knox County Master Gardeners, and our goal is to be here to help answer your gardening questions. So as we're getting started, I thought I'd show you a few things that are going on and that I've seen in gardens near me. So this is in my backyard. It's a reblooming clematis. I actually don't remember the name of it anymore, but it's doing really well this year, better than it's done in several years. Um, this is, a lot of people call this little guy a bee, but he's actually a surfeit fly. And they'll lay eggs on plants that have aphids on them and their larvae eat many, many aphids. They're really beneficial. And the adults are actually good pollinators. This is an interesting thing I saw at UT Gardens. It's in the vegetable garden. And it's actually on, the, on, the, on one of the paths. They have it marked off. But this is actually a bumblebee nest. You don't usually see those. And the little pot looking things are actually where they store their honey. But they're not, bumblebee nests aren't very big and they don't really aggressively guard them. Now this is a creature I expect to hear more questions about. Um, that's actually a vole. It looks like a short fat mouse. And that's actually also at UT Gardens. He was roaming between the herb spiral and the flower bed next to it. So I th I'm pretty sure we got a question about ants in your vegetable garden. So Toby, could you read that? Sure. Uh, this question comes from Erica and Campbell. I have a ton of ants in the garden. I'm worried they will kill my squash blossoms. How do you recommend dealing with ants in a veggie patch? Well, this is actually my vegetable garden a few weeks, about a month ago. Um, and here you see a large fire ant mound. It was actually under a tarp for a while. So that's why it's so flat and not mounted up. The first thing is to identify what kind of ants you have. If you're just seeing a few here and there, you don't really don't have anything to worry about. They're probably the native ants and they're pretty good pollinators and they won't harm your blossoms. If you have an extensive mound, you know, like this, um, usually they're mounded up more than this, but this one was flattened. Um, you really do want to move it. There are very few chemical or even organic solutions that you can safely use in a vegetable garden. Um, the best solution is to go in with a stick or a shovel and carefully poke it. They will boil out like a volcano. So you need to, keep, need to watch where the ants are so they don't get on you because their stings can be painful. And mold, they will sting you a lot if they can get inside your clothing. Um, just to get them to move. And if you do it, disturb a significant amount of their nest, they will move to another location. And if you can get them to move out of the vegetable garden, you can use one of the commercial fire ant, the chemical fire ant mound killers. Um, there are, there is a product that uses an organic substance called spinosad that's made for fire ant mounds. I haven't tried it and I don't know how effective it is. But there are some mound treatments that are very effective, but you can't use them in a vegetable garden. So the best, yeah. 
Amy, I just also posted in the chat something from uh, University of Florida Extension about sustainable fire ant control. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, they have more problems there than we do here. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Oh, there's back to the chamomile. So that's the end of the slideshow for now. And I'm going to go to where you can all see our pictures. Okay, so do we have any more questions? Um, not in the, that, that came in over the link, but I wanna say there were some that when you posted, let me open, open up here. Okay. Uh, we talked about last week about free mulch. Lily asks, is there any place in, in Knox County for free mulch? We talked about that last week. Right, we did. So check that out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, there is- noise. Yeah. Asked if talk more about neonicotinoids. Yeah, Aaron asks, in a comment thread earlier, there was a mention of neonicotinoids and someone mentioned that most people wouldn't know about them. Would you be willing to throw in a quick refresher? Okay, I do not have an instruct instruction book in front of me, but they are a synthetic um, pesticide that is what's called systemic. That means that it's not only your when you treat with a systemic um, pesticide, the plant takes it up and it ends up being in the tissues of the plant. And so with a systemic pesticide, um, you don't actually have to hit the bug with the pesticide. They, when they eat the plant, it will kill them. So neonicotinoids are systemic pesticides that the plant takes up into its tissues. And I have a link here from Cornell. Oh, good. Would you post that in the comments yeah. under this? And so there's definite concerns. Okay, neonicotinoids are very effective at pest control for things that actually eat the plant. Um, that can be aphids that suck on plants, plant juices. Um, I actually think they're fairly effective against scale, but the big concern is there seems to be some evidence that they could they are related to bee decline it's not very hard evidence at this point but there does seem to be a relationship and also there's concerns about neonicotinoids being harmful to beneficial insects because most beneficial insects at least at some stage of their life are eating pollen and nectar as a food source so if they're getting that from a plant that's been treated with neonicotinoids, it could be harmful. So that is my knowledge on that subject. So there's a lot of, lot of inconclusive research currently. So that, that's a topic that's being worked on. Here's a question from Stephanie that came in on this topic. Uh, not do the neonicotinoids ever leave the plant how do, long does it take to get them out of the plant if ever i believe they do because i know with trees they talk about retreating every three, three to five years that's one of the things they're using on the hemlock trees and the smokies to help keep those going as they're being attacked by the hemlock woolly adulgid which is a form of an aphid um, so if they're having to retreat trees every three to five years, I would say by that time, the effect of it is wearing off. I don't know absolutely, you know, I don't, don't know very solidly that reference that Roseanne posted might have some more information on that. Yeah, it has a lot of other links to Okay, great. Awesome. For more information. Yeah. And okay, do we have any other questions? Uh, let's see here. <laughs> no. Okay, so if we don't, well, I hope a lot of you got your vegetable plants and bedding plants out this week. 
because the rain and the moderate temperatures we're having right now are really ideal for them. To I get have a them. question. Should I type it in there? I have a question <laughs> about fertilizers. <laughs> okay. You, you are in a privileged position and okay. you can just yeah. ask your question. I just, with all the rain, if you use organic fertilizers, mm -hmm. do they get washed away or do they stick around um, regardless of the volume of rain that you get? in a raised bed? In a raised bed. It really depends on what the fertilizer is. Okay. Um, just one example is if you're dealing with phosphorus. So yes. two bone ways of meal. Right, bone meal and yes. rock phosphate yes. are the two ones. Bone meal might actually be, the nutrients might be washed out. Okay. Rock phosphate, which takes much longer to break down into a plant available form, it's got to have microbes work on it much more, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't be likely to wash out. So it okay. really depends on the fertilizer. And the same would go with, with the chemical fertilizers. Some of them are much more likely to wash out than others. Okay. And so I think you really just have to watch your, how your plant is doing plants are doing. And I would say in general, an organic fertilizer is probably less likely to wash than a chemical fertilizer. But I can't tell you that 100%. Yeah. So what is it? This week, I was able to get my tomato row planted, my squash last week. So they're looking really nice. And I have some what is it, lazy housewife pole beans that are starting <laughs> on their strings. <laughs> yeah. Amy, yeah. Um, do you, when you transplant tomatoes, I've been reading about nipping off some of the, uh, the bottom um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, branches or leaves and planting it on an angle so that those where those uh, branches came off, those become root nodes and they root better that way. Have you ever done it that way? I have planted them at an angle when I've accidentally let my plants grow too tall and leggy. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to where, because you don't really want to set your plant in with the bottom of the root ball 18 inches deep. <laughs> Um, I have had those and I will plant those sideways. You have to be really careful because usually you bend, you mm -hmm. know, you'll curve the stem up mm -hmm. and you have to be really careful. I've actually snapped stems. Okay. Accidentally doing that. Okay. Um, but you can also, you know, just plant them a little deeply. That's um, why I don't mind leggy, you know, when you start yeah. from seed and you, they kind of get leggy, but with tomatoes, you can kind of right. put them, plant them deeply and pull off the yeah. bottom leaves and mound the dirt up over those holes and, and roots will grow. Yeah, yeah, I've actually done that if I accidentally let my peppers go leggy too. I'll plant them, you know, with a, with a node, that's where the leaves mm -hmm. come out. I'll plant that in the ground too. Mm -hmm. And they seem to form roots there too, just not as vigorously as tomatoes do. Oh, I didn't know peppers no. did. And I don't know that study, okay. I looked into this just recently and this, there, in our climate, we have two different things going on with tomatoes that would have, that, that would affect how you plant them. And so I looked into the studies because, you know, we're taught that you should plant tomatoes deep. Mm -hmm. so that they can grow extra roots and that you'll get more productivity out of that. I looked into it and the studies that were the evidence for that were done in irrigated fields um, where plastic, there was a plastic mulch put down. And so one of the big problems we have here with tomatoes is I call them leaf spotting diseases. It's early blight, septoria leaf spot, and there's actually a couple others, you know, that cause leaf spots and they're 
it's soil that's splattered up onto the leaves is where that comes from. The, oh, okay. The organisms are actually endemic in our soil. You can't get rid of them. They're, all, they're there. Um, you can have less, a little bit less or a little more, but the organisms are going to be there to cause those diseases. Um, so they splatter up. So we tell people to take the lower leaves off their tomatoes, but we're also telling them to plant their tomatoes deep. So when you plant them deep, the leaves are near the soil. So I want someone to do a study where they test planting them deep versus planting them, you know, leaving that leggy tomato above ground mm -hmm. where you have that distance between the first leaves and the soil where it was, so it won't splatter up. Mm -hmm. And I want to see what happens without plastic and what yeah. kind of productivity you get. I haven't been able to find any research that's been done yeah. with that uh -huh. kind of setup. Hey, Amy, on that, that uh, topic of blight and leaf spot, Debbie posted about 20 minutes ago further on down in the, in the group. Her basil was fine yesterday, but today it looks like this. What is eating it? I can't find any bugs on it. And it's got those black. It looks like if you scroll down on the, I don't know if you can see it on, later. Hey further down, but uh, it has those black spots and it, it looks like something's eating it. But I think maybe the leaf is just come, parts of the leaf are just coming off. Cause I had the same thing and I looked, looked it up and I believe on my plants that look similar to that, that it was from that uh, disease in the soil and the splashing. Oh, what do you think? Let's see, let me look at this. I found your pictures. Let's see. So let me, just sh share my screen if I can figure out how to do this again so that everyone can see what we're talking about without having to try to search for it. So these there are Debbie's go. pictures. Yep. And that really, it does make me think of, there's a fairly new disease of basil called basil downy mildew. And I am not 100% sure because with the basil downy mildew, there's usually more yellowing of the leaves than this. Yeah, I can't remember yeah. what I found because I looked it up and I can't remember what it was right. called, but it was caused by uh, water splashing up. Okay. Or, you know, so, you know, it's in a pot, so you have to be real careful just to water the ground mm -hmm. and not have the water splash up. And I tried to pick off some of the lower leaves. Right. And, you know, you can see in the top, it doesn't have it where the new shoots are coming out of the top of the basil, but I was not able to get rid of it completely. Right. So, um, yeah, well, what I would try is remove, you know, remove the bad looking leaves. We can't see the whole plant. It's always helpful to be able to see what the whole plant looks like. And so not being able to see that, I can't tell, is it just affecting some of these leaves? Is it affecting all of the leaves on the whole plant? Um, I suspect it might be, but I can't tell because these are just some tips nipped off. Because it looks like this must have been a pretty, Either these came from different plants or it was pretty mature basil. So the other thing I just look at online, many people mistake black spots on the leaves as a, a fungal infection, when mm -hmm. in reality, it's due to early frost nipping the leaves. Basil leaves are very fragile. And I did put my basil out really yep. early this year and I didn't really protect it either. So that could be what's going on too. And basil will turn black, you know, it'll turn black when it's, under 50, mm. it'll have black spots. So that might be because the growing tips look really good. Mm -hmm. And at least at my house, I had a frost two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And the weather report said it was only supposed to get down to 40. Mm -hmm. But my outdoor thermometer said it went down to 31. Mm -hmm. And that definitely would have damaged basil. Mm -hmm. I think that killed my caladium plant too. From the oh no. Plant <sighs> I know I had to go out and cover everything. Yeah. I had little baby yeah. starts of things and then I had some big tomato plants. 
that I had to wrap with Agrabon and just make sure. Oh, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I left it on for a few days because I'm like, let it heat up in there. They'll like it. <laughs> it's like a warm, cozy blanket. <laughs> okay. So do we have other people with us today or are we, we just by ourselves? No, we've got about eight folk here. Okay. Um, Cat, I saw Cat in the chat. Hey, Cat, nice to see you oh, in the chat. chat. Um, so let's see, any other questions coming up? We have about seven minutes left. Yeah, Cat did a wonderful video about tomatoes not too long ago. Maybe she can post the oh. link in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was able to see that. Donna's here she, with her hot coffee in the oh, chat good. Yeah. so uh, so back to you know what we should be doing in our gardens right now uh you know amy you were talking about putting out your seedlings what is mm -hmm. the what are the pros and cons of putting your seedlings out now what if, what if you were like me <laughs> and you start a little late and so i'm still hardening off <laughs> I'm actually starving that I'm not starving, but I've, I've stopped kind of watering and I'm letting the soil dry out and then I'm going to start hardening off. Yeah. Uh, am I too late? Am I going to miss the, the game here? Well, it depends what you're growing. Uh, tomatoes, yeah. peppers, some, I have some lettuce starts too. Well, um, lettuce you might be a little too late on. Yeah, I might be. Yeah. Yeah. Lettuce doesn't like hot weather. I might put it up by the side of my house. Sometimes the really yeah. shady area, it will... Because I've had like rocky top lettuce work okay there. Right. Um, so well, one of the things is, okay, our first frost in the fall is about October 31st, the end of October. So we have about, I, I just looked this up the other day. We have about 150 frost-free days left before mm -hmm. then. Wow. Tomatoes usually start producing, when you set your transplants in, they'll start producing about ripe tomatoes between 60 and 80 days after you plant them. Mm -hmm. um, squash, summer squash are um, 50 to 70 days before they have ripe fruit. And that's from seed. Now I have a question about that. Um, I know you put squash seeds right directly in yeah. the garden. Does the soil, the garden soil have to be 70 degrees at night or in order they to do, do better? That? They do better if the soil temperature is warm. And what I've heard is the soil temperature is usually, if you look at your average, your daytime high, you're high and you're low, mm -hmm. the soil temperature will be in the middle between those two. And it's really germination temperature. So sometimes you can get around that. Um, like beans, like it really, beans and squash, like it really warm to germinate, mm -hmm. but they'll actually grow in a little lower soil temperature. So you can actually pre-sprout some things or oh, even goodness. soak them until you're seeing the seed swelling mm -hmm. and that'll help it even if the soil is a little bit cooler oh, i'll wait God. until i'm seeing that just a little bit of that um mm -hmm. seed that root come out mm -hmm. and then i'll carefully plant it commercial growers can't do that because they're planting large quantities i'm planting four squash seeds yeah <laughs> yeah some of my squash, Roseanne, I put, I got some, I, I planted all my squash, different squashes, direct seed. I, I did not soak my seeds. I did soak my bean seeds and I nick them a little bit with a, a little bit of a knife on my hard seeds. I do that, try to get them. And then I soak them a little bit. Uh, I soak them overnight, but for my squash, I thought my acorn squash was, there was no way the seeds weren't viable. It'd been like three or three weeks. And I was like, no, not viable. Well, last week it got a lot hotter yep. and boop. And, and then I have some little patty pan squash too that came up. So it really is about the soil temperature. Mm -hmm. um, so for some of those things, yeah. But anyway, Amy, you were, t you were talking about um, 
what's going on 60 70 days for your tomatoes yeah mm -hmm. yeah so, so we have, have a couple of questions, questions here oh great oh, well we have one um devin wants to know can i lay cedar clippings on my path in the garden I don't see any issues oh, with that. Okay. That should be fine. That'll smell good too. Smell yeah. good should last a reasonable <laughs> amount of time because yeah. cedar's pretty rot resistant. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then another question about organic fertilizers. And Donna wants to share that uh, for potassium, she uses green sand and kelp meal. So Amy, what do you use? Um, I generally use, let's see, potassium and P. K. K is potassium. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, you know what? I generally, if on my vegetables, I buy an all-purpose organic vegetable fertilizer mm -hmm. okay. is what I use. And I look at the number, I want, you know, reasonable amounts of all the nutrients, but not too much. Mm -hmm. And I follow the directions on the bag. Um, I did, my, I know about the bone meal because when I did my soil test, my soil tested out in every place I tested it as very low phosphorus. Really? And so that's something I have studied on and I've actively added it to the soil. Mm -hmm. But I really, my- And my that's really question, important when you want fruit, when you have something that you want right. to, the plant to grow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and so I was seeing just not, I had had a garden at another house and it did great. And it was an older neighborhood and we moved here. And I could tell the difference in the way things were growing. If I'd been a new gardener, I wouldn't have had a clue, but I was like, my tomatoes just aren't doing good, you know, mm -hmm. and so I was able to tell. So that's where it's good to have other people giving you advice and bouncing things off. And that's what a lot of this group is for, mm -hmm. being able to say, does this look okay? <laughs> You know, and someone who's been yeah. gardening a while can say, yeah, don't worry about it. Or, yeah, I think you do have a problem there. And you should maybe do a soil test or check into it more. Let's see, is there anything else? Oh, another thing I was going to say, do you all remember a while ago we did a poll asking about a gardening experience? And... It's amazing. We've got a lot of really experienced gardeners in the group. There were over a hundred really experienced gardeners that asked, answered the poll. And a good number, and I think that was five plus years of gardening experience. Mm -hmm. And then we had another level that was, I think, three to five years. And a good number of them, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning every day. <laughs> right. Gardening is such a learning experience. There's an art and a science to it. And it feels like you never, there's no way to ever get to the end of it. No. no. Okay. So before we close, do we have any other questions? Oh, Jennifer just mentioned that she had the same thing happen with her squash seeds. They were in the ground a month and they popped up when I, I was covering for frost. Yeah. So yeah. you like force the seeds in a way, depending, yeah. you know, that's the thing too. I think you're absolutely right, Amy, about um, even if you're a new person to gardening and you're in this group, I would not hesitate a moment to ask questions because first of all, all of us, uh, all gardeners like to share their information and wisdom, whether it's a wisdom from a week of gardening or wisdom from a decade of gardening, it doesn't really matter. And um, so if you have questions about gardening, absolutely post them in our link and we'll talk about them next Saturday. And you can also post and get other opinions in the, in the group as well. So um, I just think it's a, it's a wonderful 
you know, the only way, Amy and I were talking about this last week, the only way you, the best way to learn is by doing, and you, you don't always get to experience every problem. And in some ways, that's a great thing. And in some ways, it's not because you never have to deal with it. But other people have had to deal with that problem, or mm -hmm. that question, or that different, the certain type of variety or certain, you know, so um I just think it's a wonderful group. And, and this group is so vibrant and active. I'm just so grateful for all, all of the people that have been posting. Yep. Well, what is it? It is after 930 right now. And so unless we have any specific questions from anyone, I'm going to put a picture back up. And then we will say goodbye. Goodbye. Happy Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day. Yeah, happy Memorial Day weekend. And let me find the right button. And we will see you all next week.